Current Management of Alcoholic Hepatitis, presented by Dr. Robert Gish, Senior Medical Director, St. Joseph's Hospital and Medical Center, and Dr. Waldo Concepcion, Professor of Surgery and Chief of Clinical Transplantation, Stanford University Medical Center. Greetings, my name is Dr. Robert Gish. We're here today to talk about the current management of alcoholic hepatitis. I'm affiliated with Robert G. Gish Consultants, LLC in San Diego. And we're gonna have an expanded discussion on alcoholic hepatitis. We'll be talking about prevalence, natural history, how do you evaluate patients for alcoholic hepatitis? And very importantly, we're gonna be talking about what the current management steps are for this very important disease. Let's go to the epidemiology and natural history briefly. We understand that alcoholic liver disease accounts for about half of the deaths from chronic liver disease globally. And of course, we have acute alcoholic hepatitis we'll be talking about today and how that fits into overall liver disease and how you manage and evaluate these patients. Let's take a look at USA data in 2007. There were nearly 60,000 hospital admissions for alcoholic hepatitis at that time. The average length of stay was 6.5 days, and in hospital mortality rate, nearly 7%. In Denmark, over a 10-year period up through 2008, a 28-day mortality was 34%. This was increased, the mortality rate was increased if cirrhosis was present, and the mortality rate increased with age. Here we have a graphical analysis over the years after diagnosis, and we have nearly a 60% mortality rate once a patient was diagnosed with alcoholic hepatitis in a nationwide population-based cohort study. Let's now move to the current management of alcoholic hepatitis, and management, of course, starts with clinical presentation. Alcoholic hepatitis typically presents with jaundice and right upper quadrant pain. The liver is quite tender. There's always or almost always a high white count. That white count may be 11,000 or in some cases as high as 60,000. Very commonly patients have a fever but no bacterial or viral etiology for that fever and it's believed that fever is associated with the systemic inflammatory response as well as the hepatic inflammatory response. Most cases of alcoholic hepatitis are superimposed on end-stage chronic liver disease from alcohol but of course you might have fatty liver or hepatitis C in the background. You really need to distinguish the component of end-stage liver disease and the component of acute alcoholic injury and that is best done by performing a liver biopsy. The diagnostic approach to alcoholic hepatitis is expanded here. You screen for alcohol abuse and dependence with tests like CAGE and AUDIT. One that's not listed here is the MASS test or Michigan Alcohol Self-Assessment Test. You confirm that diagnosis with a thorough history, basically from family members or support individuals, a good overall history, medical history, and physical examination. You're going to look at the AST and ALT tests, level, and ratio, and typically in alcoholic hepatitis, the AST is higher than ALT, although the levels may be in the 50 to 250, 300 range. Repeating here about the liver biopsy, keep thinking about a biopsy in these patients to score stage liver disease, alcoholic hepatitis, background liver disease, severity of cirrhosis as well. You're going to evaluate for other causes of liver dysfunction, including infection and heart disease. Do a thorough history, physical, laboratory assessment. Now, what about alcohol abuse? This typically precedes alcohol dependence, alcoholic liver injury, alcoholic hepatitis. You're going to look at the liver enzymes and in early stages of this disease the ALT may be higher than the AST and levels may be normal or very mildly elevated. The GGT is also very commonly elevated in alcoholic liver disease but it's not specific or sensitive for alcohol induced liver injury. You may see that elevated in conditions such as fatty liver, NASH non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, and the alkaline phosphatase is also typically increased, but again, not sensitive or specific. Do a complete blood count. The platelet count is a very good surrogate for the severity of portal hypertension that you might be seeing. And of course, if the platelet counts under 150,000, you're gonna be concerned. Under 100,000, you're gonna be considering an upper endoscopy to assess for varices. 
These patients are typically anemic and have an MCV that might be 102 or as high as 115 or 119. That may be from hypersplenism or, or nutritional deficiency. Albumin, bilirubin, and INR are the best liver function tests. Bilirubin, the direct bilirubin, is your best actual liver function test out of these three. You're going to, of course, be checking for renal dysfunction and do a metabolic panel looking at triglycerides and cholesterol, as well as electrolytes, and importantly, magnesium levels, typically very low in patients with alcohol abuse, dependence, alcoholic cirrhosis, and alcoholic hepatitis. On this slide, we're looking at foamy cell degeneration, inflammatory changes, Mallory's hyalin, a lot of different things are going on here, including a hint of what we call sclerosing hyaline necrosis. This again helps with the diagnosis of alcoholic liver disease, alcoholic hepatitis, and severity of that liver injury. The next slide talks about moving from a normal liver. Drinking more than 60 grams a day will move a patient relatively quickly to fatty liver. And with binge drinking, alcoholic hepatitis is more likely well, whereas chronic low-level alcoholic exposure is more likely to lead you to cirrhosis. And of course, those patients might be drinking, binge drinking on top of their background alcohol consumption. And as we mentioned, this acute on chronic liver disease, especially in cirrhotic patients, can have a mortality rate at 30 to 50% at three months. So we really must know how to manage these patients, optimize treatment, how to improve 30-day mortality rates. One way to assess those patients and predict short and intermediate term outcomes is to do scoring systems for severity. And let's, let's go a little bit deeper into these scoring systems now. This is a table that outlines the MADRI score, MELD, GAHS, which is the Glasgow score, the ABIC score, and LEAL score. And here are the different components. As you can see, bilirubin is common. I and R throughout all tests, and most actually look at renal function. Very few are looking at leukocytes, only a few assess age or albumin. Very importantly, we'll be talking about the Leal score and change in bilirubin. A little bit more detail here about pros and cons. The MADRI score has been around the longest and it's most useful with this DF cutoff of 32. We'll go into a little bit more detail about the MELD, Glasgow, ABIC score and LEAL score as we develop the data in this presentation and how you can use those in your practice. The MADRI discriminant function looks at PT versus control, serum bilirubin, and comes up with a DF value. If in the presence of hepatic encephalopathy, you can come up with a greater than 50% mortality at 28 days. This is, of course, in the absence of therapy. One month survival is excellent if the DF is under 32 at over 90%. This was published in New England Journal in 1992. Now, I'm not going to talk so much about intervention here, but let's look at the control group. The patient's randomized to no therapy. You can see with this DF over 32, very high 28-day mortality rate, about 30%. We'll get back to the steroid story shortly. Next, we're going to talk about the Lille model. Lille is a city in France where they came up with this very important assessment. And the purpose of the Lille score is to assess patients at day seven after you decide to start steroids. Steroids, we think, still remain a mainstay of therapy for alcoholic hepatitis although we'll go into what some of the data concerns and risk management is for using prednisone. But if you start prednisone at day seven, you're obligated to assess allele score at that day seven and compare it to a day zero. And the general rule that I use is a 30% reduction in that score. And a 30% reduction in bilirubin is ideal. But if that score is associated or greater than 0.45, it's associated with a marked decrease in six-month survival. Conversely, if you don't hit that milestone with the Lille score, you're going to stop steroids because that intervention has a risk that's much greater than the benefit. So Lille is critical as well as the baseline discriminant function score.
if that allele score is less than 0.45, look at the difference in survival probability compared to allele score greater than 0.45. This is an extremely useful test, knowing that steroids have a variety of complications, including infection. The MELD score originally was used to stratify patients who should and who shouldn't get tip shunt. The MELD score was then expanded for organ allocation for liver transplantation. Now we can look at the MELD score and look at that in comparison to the DF score, and it looks like MELD cutoffs of 18, 19, or 21 are very, very useful for predicting high versus low mortality rates. And again, it's the MELD score on admission that's very important. What about this Glasgow score? Let's go into a little bit more detail. The Glasgow Alcoholic Hepatitis Score gives one, two, and three points, depending on age, white count, urea, blood urea nitrogen, PT ratio, and bilirubin. This has not been validated outside of uh, Great Britain, but it looks to be a useful score and one that you could have in your armamentarium for assessing your patients and outcomes. We're now going to move to therapy. Let's talk about how we're treating alcoholic hepatitis today and what's the data behind the choice of treatments for this very important and highly fatal disease. Well, general measures, you're going to support those patients with IV fluids, electrolyte support, monitoring for infections, treating hepatic encephalopathy, managing GI bleeding. But we're going to get into some more specific treatment now for specifically alcoholic hepatitis. Now, of course, you're going to remove alcohol. You're going to manage alcohol withdrawal symptoms and signs. You're going to do uh, cultures with septic screening, blood cultures, urine cultures, uh, sputum. You're going to maximize nutrition. We'll talk about some more data on that in a moment. You're not going to use non -steroidals. You're not going to use aminoglycosides. You're going to avoid radiologic contrast for CT scans. And you're going to consider, at least in the U.S., MOA, which is midodrine, octreotide, and albumin, especially if you're seeing changes in creatinine that are consistent with hepatorenal syndrome. Terlipressin is not yet approved in the U.S., but available in many countries globally and also part of standard of care for that syndrome. What about malnutrition? Alcoholic patients with and without alcoholic liver disease have varying severity of nutritional deficiencies. You can see up in the upper left corner, no disease to severe disease with severe alcoholic signs. So we really need to assess your patients for sarcopenia. What's their muscle mass? Look at albumin, look at pre-albumin, look at muscle strength. Are they able to walk? Just look at their general physical exam and signs of muscle wasting that are present. This nutritional assessment, I believe, is critical to help improve patient management and improve patient survival. Enteral or parenteral nutrition has been a controversy in managing alcoholic liver disease and alcoholic hepatitis over the last two to three decades. And really what this table is showing is that amino acid or branch chain amino acid supplements really don't have a significant role in managing these patients. The data is weak or negative, and these treatments are very expensive. So we're gonna to go to more general nutritional comments here in a moment. Nutritional management of those patients with alcoholic hepatitis, I believe, is critical. Plouth reviewed this in 2009 and really emphasized some very key pillars of managing these patients. Aggressive caloric intake. 35 to 40 kcals per kilo per day. These patients are incredibly catabolic. Protein intake, 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilo per day. Now, I think the use of nasoenteric tubes are very important because patients can't possibly keep up with this calorie and protein intake. You should consider intravenous lipids, and there's new lipid formulations that are out today that are less inflammatory than the soybean-based uh, lipids that we've used historically. You want to treat nutritional deficiencies. Magnesium deficiency can be profound. Vitamin K, vitamin D, vitamin E deficiencies can be very significant as well. So you assess levels and supplement. These are critical parts of managing these patients with severe nutritional deficiencies. This nutritional therapy 
as a stepwise approach, but we know that mortality increases or correlates with low calorie intake. Medium chain triglycerides would be an option as well. Enteral is preferred to parental supplementation. Now, what about nutrition versus prednisone? This is an interesting study with nasoduodenal two feeds at 2,000 kcals per day, 35 patients for 28 days, versus prednisolone, typical dose, 40 milligrams per day, also for 28 days. There is no difference in 28 mortality between the patient groups. This is very, very important, but the mortality rate during follow-up was much higher in the steroid group at 27% versus 8%. So you could summarize here, the nutritional support equals steroids, short-term, and long-term, steroids has a much higher complication rate. So I'm a strong supporter of nutritional support for these patients with information derived from this study. Composition of the enteral diet, protein, carbs, fat, monitor sodium levels. As you know, sodium can be low in patients with alcoholic hepatitis, as well as other forms of acute and chronic liver disease. You want to keep the sodium level above 130. You want an excellent amount of free water, watching the UN and creatinine ratios, looking at urine lights, looking at urine osmolality. And you want this high caloric density due to the high amounts of calories needed for their stress level. Causes of death during treatments, quite interesting, in the steroid group versus the total enteral nutrition. But you're seeing a variety of different complications in these groups. And it looks from this study, my interpretation is, is that total enteral nutrition doesn't increase complications. There's often fears of placing tube feeds, often because of discomfort or perceptions. Really, I think the benefit outweighs risks. A little bit more on follow-up phase, and look at all the complications of steroids, whereas minimal complications in the total enteral nutrition group. More about infections during that 28-day period with a list of the different bacteria in the right column that can be seen. Close monitoring for pulmonary, blood, urine, and peritoneal infections is critical in these patients. A little bit more during that 28-day period, the type of infection and the organisms. This is the difference in survival, 62% versus standard at 40%. Now, this did not reach statistical significance, probably due to the fact that it was underpowered, but I still believe that this has a benefit that outweighs risks. A little bit more here about probability of survival during the entire period. You're looking again at better survival in the enteral nutrition versus the standard treatment group. In conclusion, total enteral nutrition is as effective as steroids in the short term and may be safer in the long term and does supply intensive nutritional support for these patients with severe nutritional deficiencies. Let's now talk about steroids in more detail. What's the data? Where do we consider using these medications? This is a systematic review of glucocorticoids for alcoholic hepatitis using the Cochrane system and published by the Cochrane Hepatobiliary Group. In this systematic review with meta-analyses, trial sequential analyses, randomized trials, there was a favorable trend towards treatment with prednisone even though the number of high quality studies was relatively low at about six. A little bit more here, again, the systematic review, trial sequence analysis, showing trends in favor of treatment, looking at MADRI score over 31 as a specific criteria in the top group. Corticosteroids improve short-term survival in patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis, this was published in Gut in 2011 by Philippe Mathurin. Very important to look at the statistical difference of p-value of 0 0.0005, benefiting steroids over the non-steroid treatment group. Corticosteroids improve short-term survival. This again is a little bit more data, talking about steroids and the hazard ratio, about a 60% reduction. MADRI score cutoff that we described before, 
And very importantly here, they looked at this LEAL model and this seven-day response according to LEAL criteria showing a very, very good difference in survival. Also data here saying the patients with encephalopathy appeared to benefit as well. Therefore, our encephalopathy is a screening test for steroids and steroid use. Early change in bilirubin level. It's a very, very nice summary slide saying a bilirubin change at seven days is a predictor of utility of steroids, continuing steroids for those patients. So you can look at the LEAL model and do some, uh, I'd say, fancy or extensive calculations, or you can look just at the bilirubin at day seven. I have this simple rule looking for a 30% bilirubin reduction to justify prednisone, prednisolone continuation. This is a graph looking at the LEAL model, which is an AUC, and it talks about the accuracy of the LEAL model or improvement of the LEAL model in terms of predicting outcomes. I think this is very important. The LEAL model be part of your armamentarium. And at seven days, you don't meet the LEAL criteria or the bilirubin criteria. Stop prednisolone or prednisone or the specific steroid that you're using. Interesting here again, talking about survival differences with the LEAL score using that 0.45 cutoff. A little bit more, responders versus non-responders, looking at this difference in survival. Non-responders, no differences in survival with steroids looking out 28 days. Make sure you exclude SBP, do a paracentesis on all patients with ascites, you want to rule out uh, an infection. Prophylaxis with one of the afloxacins, norfloxacin is no longer available, but that was what the original data showed, so Cipro or Leviquin would be options. Treat infections aggressively if present, also UTIs, pulmonary infections, bacteremia. Now let's talk about another critical recent study called the STAPA trial for alcoholic hepatitis. This looked at prednisolone with pentoxifiline, prednisolone with placebo, pentoxifiline with placebo, or double placebo, and percent mortality rates were similar across these groups. Very large study. This put a little bit of a stop on using prednisolone, but we have to look at this study critically in terms of subset analyses and what occurred in special patient populations. We're now going to move to pentoxifiline. Pentoxifiline is a TNF inhibitor. It's an oral medication originally used as uh, something to change plasma uh, rheology or viscosity, but it's been used in a variety of other settings as a TNF inhibitor, as an oral TNF inhibitor. And let's talk about this. This is a study from Acriviatus who showed that about 50 patients in each arm, the pentoxifiline helped patients who had renal insufficiency signs of hepatorenal syndrome. So pentoxifiline remains as an option, not necessarily a protocol-driven therapy, but as an option in managing patients, especially if they're showing signs of progressive renal injury or insufficiency. Pentoxifiline in general did not decrease short-term mortality rate did reduce complications in patients with advanced cirrhosis. So in the new guidance document, managing alcoholic hepatitis, pentoxifiline remains as an option, but not a requirement or a specific guidelines in managing such patients. 36 out of 34 patients in each arm, 30 to 35% mortality rate was seen in a corticosteroid plus pentoxifiline versus steroids alone. So an add-on in general doesn't appear to be useful with pentoxifiline, but you may wish to use that in patients with renal insufficiency or progressive renal insufficiency. A little bit more on TNF inhibition. Pentoxifiline switch in severe alcoholic hepatitis is inefficient, ineffective in non-responders to steroids. So if you're looking at somebody who's not responding to corticosteroids, switching to pentoxifiline did not appear to be useful. Guidelines, 2017, just published. Pentoxifiline is listed as an option in selected patients with alcoholic hepatitis.
What about infliximab, an injectable TNF inhibitor? This is a controlled trial, infliximab with prednisolone in acute alcoholic hepatitis, published in 2004 by Navo. Two different arms here, but no benefit of infliximab. And there were medical and infectious complications of infliximab, probably from excess immune suppression. So infliximab is not part of our armamentarium. Let's now move to a relatively cheap compound, N-acetylcysteine, that we're all experts at using in our patients with acetaminophen overdose. What's the data? Should we consider that in managing alcoholic hepatitis? NAC alone, ineffective. So if you're thinking about treating patients and using just NAC in your management, this does not appear to be a significant option. Two different papers published in 2007 and 2010. What about glucocorticoids plus NAC? This was published from a French group in severe alcoholic hepatitis. There is a trend towards N-acetylcysteine improving survival, but it did not reach statistical significance. So I think this is back to the art of managing these patients. The data does not support NAC specifically as an add-on to glucocorticoids. What about using N-acetylcysteine with glucocorticoids? In this French study, there was a trend towards improved survival when you added NAC to prednisolone, but it did not reach statistical significance. This brings us back to the art of managing alcoholic hepatitis and a consideration for NAC as an add-on in patients, but the data is not strongly supportive. Dr. Concepcion from Stanford will now present additional current and future treatment options. My name is Walter Concepcion. I'm professor of surgery at Stanford University. And today we're going to talk about current management of alcoholic hepatitis. We're going to focus today on therapy, more specifically liver transplantation. Defining today the role of liver transplantation for acute uh, hep alcoholic hepatitis is a, a significant task. The studies that we have done in patients in which severe alcoholic with a high index of, of uh, damage due to the alcoholic hepatitis with no response to steroids, the six-month mortality for this cohort of patients is approximately 70 percent. We're talking about a very deleterious condition in which at the present time we require more study and more therapies available for these patients. One of the important aspects uh, that we have seen for liver transplantation in these patients is that we require at the present time six months sobriety. As we know now, and we have known for a while, six months sobriety is a poor indicator for alcohol recidivism. We are looking, and we have been looking recently more about what better predictors are for preventing recidivism. And we have been able to focus on social support and psychiatric comorbidities. Patients with alcoholic hepatitis that have not been widely considered for transplant due to lack of six months of sobriety, despite of a liver transplant being established as a therapy, is a concern in this day and age. The fact that the six months are not met on some of the patients is a factor that concerns because most of them are very ill, as we mentioned before, with a high mortality, and time is not in their favor. The possible barriers that are for the wider use of liver transplantation includes the fear of recidivism, donor organ shortage, social and ethical considerations. In looking at, at this challenge, we have a very important uh, publication that was published in 2011 by the study group from France and, and Belgium, led by Dr. Maturin, in which they published a paper called Early Liver Transplantation, the French and Belgium Experience. In this group, they address the issue of early transplantation for alcoholic hepatitis. Early liver transplantation in non-responders undergoing their first event of liver disease. Non-responders were identified if the Lily score was more than 0.45 or worsening of the liver function by day seven. These are important aspects. These are patients that medical therapy did not succeed. There were seven centers perform a uh, transplant for early liver transplant for patients with a, a severe alcoholic hepatitis. The severity was already described, and all these patients were considered non-responder to steroids. Important to mention, all these patients was the first decompensation e event, 
all these patients were characterized as having good psychosocial support. Patients agreed with the treating team to undergo a lifelong alcohol abstinence. And all members of the evaluation team and treatment team, including hepatologists, nurses, surgeons, social workers, resident fellows, all of them in a conjoint session, session decided to list this patient for transplantation that they were suitable candidates. Important is to mention that in the evaluation of this patient was a different model that was used in the sense that it's a comprehensive model that started first with the evaluation from the immediate team, the nurses, residents, fellows, then went to the hepatologists, then to the specialist, the addiction specialists, and finally a total decision between the surgeon, anesthesiologists, and hepatologists. This is important because everyone that is involved in the patient or this uh, caring for these patients has a different op opinion, has a different angle in mm -hmm. which will help to the evaluations, uh, uh, evaluation of these patients. If you look at the outcomes for early liver transplant for alcoholic hepatitis, they, they're significant, they're worth mention. The group that responded to medical management, that were the control, at six months, there were a 85 percent survival on these patients that were responders. In the patient in which they were not considered non-responders, that essentially underwent medical therapy and progressed, there was a, a survival rate of 30 percent. The exciting part is that patients in which were selected according to the parameters that we mentioned before, they had a 77.6 percent survival at six months on this selected group. Other I observations that were made on this cohort of patients is that no alcohol relapse was present on this patient within six months period. They dedicated himself to follow the steps that were, uh, that were prepared for them. Three patients had recidivism at 720, 740, and uh, 1,140 days after transplant. Two had developed daily consumer, and one of them had an occasional consumption that was considered not consistent, not continuous uh, uh, use. In the area of, of what number of these patients represented the total volume of these patients in relation with the total transplant volume, the two centers uh, describes that it was 1.83 percent of the transplant were these patients recruited into the severe alcoholic hepatitis. If you look at a uh, corresponding number of patients that were involved in the all the cohort of centers involved, he was 2.92 percent and 8.25 percent respectively. So this gives you the idea that this is a very severe lethal disease. The non-responder patients is really a group that is very, very threatening with survival if they don't undergo liver transplant, but at the same time, very few of them qualify and survive long enough to undergo liver transplant. If you look at the survival, one year survival, the liver transplant recipients versus control for severe alcoholic hepatitis was 77% survival for the transplant group and 23% survival with the severe control patients that did not undergo liver transplant. This is a very important number in the sense that 77 percent of the group that underwent transplant were able to be helped with transplant. This is important to mention that this is a complete new findings that we have now to proceed forward in the United States. Uh, recently in 2015, Hassanin uh, performed a national survey out of 110 centers in the United States that uh, performed liver transplant, 45 answered the survey. Out of this group, 12 out of 45 centers, a significant 27 percent reported listing patients for alcoholic hepatitis. So out of 3,290 transplants performed in this cohort, only 45 were done for alco severe alcoholic hepatitis, or a 1.37 percent. The survival on this group of patients was at six months, 93 percent, at one year, 93 percent, and at five years, 87 percent. The alcohol recidivism of, the, of this group of patients was 17 percent. Remember, this is a group of acute, severe hepatitis, alcoholic hepatitis. 
Comparing the 17% of alcoholic recidivism on patients that were from this group of acute is compared to the 15 to 20 percent that is in the literature on these patients that have been transplanted for alcoholic cirrhosis. We can say that in selected group of patients, under the parameters that we described before, this is a group that can be considered for transplantation. Again, very selected group. When we talk about severe alcoholic uh, hepatitis and liver transplantation, we have come a long way. In my personal experience, I was in the early 80s when liver transplantation was completely a, a contraindication for a liver transplantation as cirrhotic as an acute. Why? Because we consider this was not a disease that we're going to transplant. If we follow the history from there, we can see that in 2006 in Lancet, there was a formal recognition that alcoholic hepatitis is an absolute contraindication in the United Kingdom for liver transplantation. First of all, abstinent pretransplant is necessary to exclude those that will improve and not need transplantation. So timeline, that six months, whatever time of that was important to determine this. And abstinence is a useful time for assess and verify alcohol addictive behavior. But we understand that six months rule is not a robust criterion for this patient. What we assume that was true and the data, both of them don't correlate. And these thoughts have been keeping coming through years. Are we doing the right decisions for this significant uh, danger group of the severe alcoholic hepatitis? If you look at Foster publication in Hepatology 1997, bringing parameters for alcoholic liver disease, you will see that abstinence less than six months in his studies produced significant amount of, of recidivism. There was significant uh, emphasis on the more than six months to provide patients to be safe for transplantation. Going forward, and if you look at, at January uh, 2005, there was a consensus conference that said indication for liver transplantation. Everybody in that context at the end said we need a wait and, wait and watch strategy using the six months criterion. Maybe unfair for these patients that are non responder. Maybe there'll be a selected group of patients that should not die in this period of time, waiting to get improvement from medical therapy, or if they improve, they're going to die. Immediately, a pile of studies were recommended for evaluating this group for early transplantation on trans uh, non-responders of acute, severe acute alcoholic hepatitis. So we look back, alcoholic hepatitis is an acute presentation of alcoholic liver disease. If you ask this patient, they had never known they had liver disease before. This is the first time that they have been jaundiced, and they have not been informed that alcohol is the source of their, of their injury. In patients with secure alcoholic hepatitis who does, do not respond to steroids, we know already confirmed by many studies that the six-month mortality is at least 70%. The treatment options, if you look at the, you want to focus on the therapeutic modalities available for these groups, we have steroids that have been proven to have effect on some of the patients, and nutrition. Liver transplantation is an effective therapy offered for selected group of patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis. In our country, currently it's offering less than 30% of the programs in the United States, and the outcomes are comparable to all non-severe alcoholic hepatitis patients that is outstanding approximately 70 to 80%. There's no difference on recidivism of these patients between severe alcoholic hepatitis and alcoholic cirrhotics with six months of abstinence. At this present time, we have the hope to have different therapies, probably more effective than we have now. Some of them are based in pre altering the gut microbiome and preventing the leaky gut syndrome that is a source of uh, many other complications. Other treatments that are available in the horizon are the use of GCSF. If we look at the, at the concept of GCSF, is the granulocyte stimulating factor. It's an effective agent to mobilize hematopoietic stem cells to different areas of the, of the body, in this case, improve liver function, as well as survival in patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis. This is some of the areas that were in the future we're going to be hearing more in the treatment of this patient. The next uh, 
alternative that we have for treating this patient is the MARS system or ECAD, extracorporeal albumin dialysis. This in this uh, system is a hemofiltration system in which, as in dialysis, a catheter is placed, the blood is extracted from the body, put on a, uh, on a system in which the plasma is circulated through different columns. One is water soluble, another is protein bound, and another was lipid soluble in which different type of toxic agents are removed through adsorption. This system has been in use for a long time. I have, been I have used it about 20 years ago. And in selected patients can offer improvements. If you look at the long-term survival effect of doing this therapy on patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis, we still have significant amount of patient loss. Our next uh, treatment modality that we have for patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis is the ELAT system. The ELAT system is a human cell-based support system designed to improve the survival in acute forms of liver failure. This system is based on using allogeneic cellular therapy and is delivered in a continuous base treatment between three and five days. If I can let you imagine it in your, in your Im imagination that this system has four cartridges in which allocated into inside of them is a total of 440 grams of cells, human cells that are C3A liver-derived cells. These are liver-like cells, not specifically hepatocytes, and we'll talk a little more later about the function. Initially, I personally believe that the cells, what we're doing is purifying the blood. But a lot more studies have been done, a lot more investigation have been done, and what these cells do is to interact with the plasma, infusing, delivering factors that will help the liver improve. A lot of these agents also interact directly with agents that promote inflammation, controlling them and decreasing the amount of inflammation. All these factors are done by these cells interacting directly with the plasma and returning some of these factors into the patient. Several studies have been done over time using the ELAT system. First study was to see how can we make it safe. Now, the VTI-208, we created this study to evaluate what's the effect of the ELAT on acute alcoholic hepatitis. In August 21st, 2015, we presented that the system was not being able to modify survival. And we presented that, personally, I was completely say, well, gosh, this is really terrible. But when we start analyzing, when we start looking at what went right and what went wrong, one of the aspects that we found out is that there's a cohort of groups in which the injury, uh, uh, the liver injury and the total body injury is not as advanced. Using the MEL score, the MEL score, statistically we found a MEL score of 28. These are patients who still have significant amount of injury, still have significant amount of mortality due to the injury and non-responders, but they are not in the terminal phase of the injury can be very well suitable to receive benefit from the ELAT system. And from this group, we learn also that this group also, even though they have side effects, and we can mention them, there's a still a significant amount of them that can present side effects and we can, some of them even stop the ELAD because of the complications that can happen, but it's at a low number. Understanding these factors, we can then proceed to find out the safety of the, pro of the ELAD found the cohort of patients in which we can treat successfully, and from there develop what we're looking for today is what I call the trial VTL-308. This is a multi-center, multinational uh, trial. These are patients with melt less than 30. This involves a INR less than 2.5, a creatinine less than 1.3 milligrams per deciliter, and age less than 50 years of age. Important to mention is that we expect to see in this group a bilirubin more than 16. In this study, we expect to enroll approximately 150 subjects. 
Thank you, Dr. Concepcion. We now conclude this video with additional thoughts from Dr. Gish. What are the steps in alcoholic hepatitis management? Abstinence, support, nutrition, vitamins, pernicillone, strong consideration, pentoxifiline, softer consideration, referral to a liver transplant center, referral to liver centers that may have research studies ongoing in managing alcoholic hepatitis so we can further advance the care and improve the survival of these patients who in general are gonna have limited access to organs. Managing these patients requires special expertise and at your institution if you're managing patients using internal guidelines, guidance documents would be very important to manage patients for best outcomes. What about newer therapeutic targets? We're looking at a variety of different areas caspase inhibitors is one example, more selective inhibition of different inflammatory markers such as IL-6, IL-1 beta, as well as TNF, maybe interleukin-1 receptor antagonists, modulating Cooper cells, modulating different major components of the inflammatory process, decreasing gut permeability, changing the biome in the GI tract, potentially with probiotics, other support options will be looked at in patients short-term and long-term. So in conclusion, we have therapeutic algorithms for managing alcoholic liver disease, also recent guidelines for managing acute alcoholic hepatitis, staging disease, support, nutritional assessment, nutritional support, feeding, prednisolone, pentoxifiline, clinical trials, managing their underlying liver disease are all critical steps to maximize outcome in these patients. Surgeon General recently announced that both drug dependence and alcohol dependence should be treated as medical diseases with, of course, a full psychiatric assessment. More on therapeutic algorithms. Look at how recent their jaundice occurred. What's their longstanding alcoholism and recidivism rate? What about GI bleeding in these patients? Look at liver chemistries, do discriminant functions, think about the Leal score in managing your patients. Consider working with a liver unit, liver transplant center, and centers that have clinical trials available. A Little bit more about avoiding nephrotoxicity, discussing the possibility of using N-acetylcysteine, and improving overall outcomes by looking at quality indicators at your institution. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for this presentation on managing alcoholic hepatitis, thinking about best options, best clinical practices for improving your patient's outcome. Thank you very much.